This is the podcast for first home buyers who want to get it right. If you're suffering from analysis paralysis, can't work out who to believe, hate dealing with agents, sick of your parents telling you where you should buy, you think the market's leaving you behind, or you're just worried about making a huge mistake, then you're in the right place. I'm Megan and that was Veronica. We're both buyers agents and probably old enough to be your mums, but it's a good thing because between us, we've got over 40 years experience to share with you. Together, we're going to make sure you get unbiased and real information that you can rely on so you can get where you need to get without missing a step. This is your first home buyer guide. If you'd like to know how we can help you buy your first home and avoid a whole heap of nasty pitfalls, head on over to the website, homebuyeracademy.com.au, and there you'll find free checklists to download, a free mini course on how to price a property, and our where to buy tutorial for only $39. Priceless stuff, really. Absolutely. But before we get into the interesting stuff in this week's episode, here's the boring stuff, the disclaimer. <laughs> Everything we talk about on the podcast is general in nature and hasn't taken into account your personal circumstances so should never be considered to be personal advice we always recommend getting the advice of a professional in their field of expertise now this could be a buyer's agent a licensed financial advisor or a mortgage broker depending on your needs the content you're about to enjoy is correct at the time of recording but things are changing on a daily basis so check with the relevant government authority or your advisors to get the most up-to-date information In this episode, we're going to share with you some property investment fundamentals. Now, this, of course, will be important if your choice is to rent fest rather than to live in your first property. But owner occupiers also need to think of their home as an investment. And it's particularly important for first home buyers, because if you get this purchase right, your financial future will be a whole lot brighter. It most certainly will. Veronica, let's talk investment grade. What in the world do we mean by that? Now, the first thing we want to talk about is what we mean when we say investment grade. This is different to investor stock. Veronica, typical (laughs) investor stock is go. Off the plan, one bedroom (laughs) apartments in big complexes and two bedroom boxes in big complexes. I mean, it's soulless. It doesn't have any scarcity. It's built. There's just more and more and more that can be built, isn't there? Like it's replicable and 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 there's no scarcity around the land and they're often sort of all bunched together in certain suburbs that are zoned for higher density. Uh, Here's one, dual key, um, what they call them, dual key key places. Dual key, those those duplexes that they sell around Logan and in, in, in southeast Queensland. Mm, yep, that's mm. that's another investment grade. That's anything that anything essentially where things are kind of vanilla, cookie cutter, generic, um, and largely sold to first home buyers and investors. Well, he, he, so, yeah, they're heavily marketed to mm. investors. And, you know, that you'll get spruikers love this stuff. They basically make a bucket load of money flogging this stuff. They'll take you on tours. And they'll educate you as to why capital growth is terrible, and you need rental yield. And for the have you price- have you ever heard those uh, those brokers that go around saying you could own a property for twenty dollars a week? Oh, for the price of a cup of coffee a day. <laughs> a day. <laughs> And oh God, help me! <laughs> look, I've been lately reading a lot of the articles that are often in the Herald, or that's the Herald in Sydney, or in uh, the Australian, the Financial Review. These articles about spruikers and these investment advisors and all the people are complaining basically because, you know, their super was meant to be spent wisely and, and you know, you were going to make money, you could be a property investor too, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they find themselves going backwards and that means that they're losing money. So that's mm. investor stock. And what first-time buyers definitely don't want to do is get caught up buying investor stock, particularly if you think you're in rent vesting, okay, I need to buy something that's for investors. You don't. No. Investment grade is for living Own. people that live in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, for homes and lifestyle and and people don't want to live in something that was built for people on low in, 
you know, that, that can't afford to buy their own home. They want a nice lifestyle, but they're renting for a reason that obviously suits them, whether it's that they don't want to commit to a property, you know, they're still checking out different areas, but they still want a property that is good enough quality in a good enough location to actually have a good lifestyle. So it, it has to, it has to kind of, but Veronica, and, and we're going to get to this in a, in a moment, and I'm sorry if I'm jumping ahead, but I'm very excited <laughs> about it. And, and that is that you don't want your future buyer to be another investor. No, you actually investors don't pay premium. So when you become yes. a seller, you want people who are going to be emotionally attached to this property that you own and pay your premium price as a seller. Exactly. So this is the trap that people fall into when they're buying investments. They think I have to buy something that's made for investors. The problem is it's only people like you that want to buy it and you want other people who also want to buy it. And that's the difference between investor stock and investor grade. Absolutely. Now tell us why, Veronica, capital growth is more important than you. Okay. So uh, often it goes back to this investor stock versus investor grade thing as well, because investor stock often they talk about the rent that you will get or the yield that you will get, and you might get a high yield. So at the moment, you know, depending let's, on let's what... just break down yield really quickly. Okay. So yield basically is the amount of rent you get or income you get for that property. And typically, it, it well, not typically, it is calculated as a proportion or a percentage of the purchase price. So in the olden days, it was always thought if you pay $500,000 for a property, you get $500 a week rent for it, right? How and good that, those days? Oh, they were great because that was, and <laughs> that that's the equivalent was, that of a 5% good. yield, right? Yep, yep. Um, yep. And it goes up if you get 600 a week you know, rent for the $500,000 investment, then that's a, probably a 6% yield. Or, anyway, it, but it's... I'm not going to calculate that, but let's, not let's calculate give them the formula really quick, quickly. It's weekly rent times 52 weeks a year over the purchase price. And that gives you gross rental yield. Yes. It is a measure, a guide, a bit of an idea. Um, it's not set in stone and it's nothing that you should make a decision on. But and it here's is a... The thing. a it's something we refer to a lot. We do. We talk about yield. And this is the thing that's really important. The yield, once you buy that property and then if you own it for 10 years, when you calculate the yield, you've got to calculate what it's worth at the time that you're calculating it, not at the purchase price. That's that's in terms of making sure it's keeping track with the rest of the market. That's just keeping a little up. side issue, but let's yep. not get caught up in that. Okay. Um, let's move on, shall we? The thing is that with the yield, so that's how much rent you get. So a lot of people will say, you've got to have enough rent to cover the mortgage. Well, actually, there's a problem with that because the sort of property that will give you enough rent to cover the mortgage, well, in fact, I don't think there is one in Australia anymore. Mm, I don't know, Veronica. In Brisbane, we're sitting at about 3.6, 3.7% gross yield and you can get uh, you can get an investment loan. Now, we're in December 2020. Um, you can get investment loan if you're on if you're matching with a home loan rate. So if you've got both a home loan and investment rate at under 2%. So because of interest rates, there are potentially... Um, properties that will cover themselves, that is not a reason to buy a particular property. No, it is not a reason to buy a particular property, although obviously cash flow is important and you do mm. need to have income and you do have to be able to... Um, you need a 2%, 2.5% buffer at least on interest rates. So you've got to expect that at some point that will probably go back to you know, being neutral or slightly negatively geared. So generally speaking, general rule of thumb is that the better the asset the lower the yield. And it doesn't really make sense, I know, but you actually get a lower yield. And the reason you get a lower yield is because the price or the value of it is going up. Now, the rents will always have pressure on it because of basically because of wages, whereas actual property prices, they can go up because people can borrow, you know, and so borrowing is what's called leveraging. And that's basically where they can actually make their, their income work harder for them. So they can borrow money and they've got more money to invest uh, when they're buying. So fundamentally though, the, the problem with focusing only on yield is that really, if you think about it, the compounding nature of property and, and, and the ability for a property to be bought today at X dollars and go up in time, Please understand we're not saying every property goes up and we're not saying they go up every year either, but the long, in a long-term uh, plan, and this is what we're hoping to encourage you to 
think with a long-term view, you buy a really good asset, you're in the accumulation phase in your life. If you're it's a, a long person. runway, there's a long, you know, as a first time buyer, whether you're in your twenties or your thirties, because I know that we have a lot of students who've been well into their thirties as first time buyers. This is the accumulation phase. So this is, you know, talking to your financial advisor, you, you, you really need to be looking at how you are building towards rather than just looking to generate an income from a property. I just want to, I just want to talk about, you talked about um, often high yielding properties and high potential for capital growth don't often come together. And there's a really good reason for that. And that is the yield comes from the improvements that sit on the land. So that's the the house, if you like, or the, the property that sits on the land. That's what tenants will pay higher rent for is what's good in that. And, you know, you and I had a conversation mm -hmm. about a particular property today that needs a little bit of work. So the yield isn't that great on it. Um, but the capital growth potential comes from the land and that's what tenants don't pay for. So yeah. if you've got, a, if you buy a property for a price and you've got more of a house sitting on the land, you'll probably get a bit more income, but probably a trade-off is less capital growth. Whereas if the value of the land that you've bought in that packet it's not house and land package, but that package in an established area in a good quality suburb. Um, if you've paid more for the land component and there's not much in the house component, you won't get as much rent, but your potential for capital growth is likely to be stronger. It's a really good point, actually, because, you know, like you can buy a block of land and it could be in a really good area and it can appreciate in value. You're not going to get a cent rent for it mm. unless you can adjust it to the farmer next door, depending on what <laughs> so. <laughs> but Farmer Joe <laughs> next door with his farmer cattle, Joe, yes. his sheep, couple so, of yes. goats. You are, yeah. The tenant pays for the improvements. That's a really good distinction. So if you sit down though and you compounded $100 a week extra in rent, right, and, and you compounded that out over 10 years, you'd be looking at, uh, and I don't know the figures in, ahead of me, I have actually done this, um, you know, you're looking at maybe, I don't know, $60,000 or something like that. But if you actually, and at bank interest, you know, not much, mm. um, if you actually sat down and worked out, if I bought a really good asset and even if it grew, say, say 4% a year. If I borrowed, you know, 80% of the money to buy that asset and I worked out how much money I would have made after I paid back that loan, everything after 10 years, you would have made potential, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's the difference between buying for capital growth and buying for yield. Yep, absolutely. Yep. All right. So we talked about, I did touch on land versus land value versus improvements. And, and this is a debate that Veronica and I have just <laughs> had. So it's really interesting when you're looking at different locations, how different rules and methodologies actually apply. And, and in Brisbane, uh, and I'm talking about the Brisbane local government area, not the greater Brisbane region, um, of which you're particularly great fan, Veronica, I say with my tongue firmly in my cheek. Um, but the, the Brisbane local government area. I don't mind uh, the Brisbane when... local government area. I just thought <laughs> I'd say that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not referring to Logan, Ipswich, Morton Redlands, you know, so it's, it's Brisbane local government area. When we buy an investment property for, for our clients, we're looking for a minimum 40% land value. So that's the site value or the rateable value from the value generals department. Um, and then we get more and more excited the closer it comes to and the high, I think the highest land value we've had that actually had a house on it was 90%. So Whoa. it was, you know, great. And that, that property has, it's rented fine. The yield sits at about 3.2, which is low for Brisbane, but in terms of growth, it's in a high growth area, high popularity. One day that house can be knocked down and something new built. And, and you know, it's from a long-term accum accumulation and potential for capital growth, it's a cracker. Um, so we, we have that sort of minimum 40%. We won't look at anything under that. Uh, but Veronica, you were talking about in Sydney, that's actually not a metric that applies. It it. You know, people want to talk about that, but the reality is it won't help you because in inner Sydney, that is, and so we're talking, say, the 10K radius around the CBD. And, you know, if you tried to do that, well, you wouldn't be buying much for starters yeah. because <laughs> the actual improvement makes a difference, um, but it's because you've got a lot of heritage homes as well, mm. you know what I mean? And, and mm. it's like the metric doesn't work. It, it's broken. You, you would use it and then you try to compare properties and it would make no sense. Yep. And it's because land in these areas is highly valuable. And even and site value land. actually is so far below market value in, in some of those sorts of areas. What someone mm. would pay for, 
a piece of land that they could knock a house down and build something new is astronomically higher than um, yes. something that has perhaps a terrace on it that is is four and a half metres wide and there's not an awful lot that you can do with it. Exactly right. It's sort of, it. yeah, it, it just doesn't make sense. So therefore you don't use it. And that does lead into the next um you know, the, the fundamental we want to talk about is what is the secret to capital growth? And and we've talked about this before and it is, local knowledge is essential because the drivers in one area that will encourage capital growth and in, an, in a different suburb or a different city, rural areas, regional areas, regional cities versus capital cities, all that sort of stuff, the dynamics in different, even suburbs within a city will vary. Side of the street markedly yeah. well but then but each suburb what is what what it comes down to what drives actually that absolutely drives capital growth is your future buyer as megan said earlier who is going to buy it and will they compete for it that's all the two questions that uh you sort of got to ask right will yeah. they compete for it are there different types of buyers that would want to buy that property and you know and is it going to be popular and if if you say that in that area because it's got to be location specific in the context of that, uh, that location, then we call that an A-grade property, highly highly desirable. It doesn't have to be the most expensive property, hasn't it? All, all other things Quite being, being um, investment grade as well. Yes, yeah. you mean the suburb being investment grade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and, the, and the aspect and the land. Uh, yeah. Well, we'll get I into could that. go on. We'll, Let's ha- we'll, how many of those things do we look at when we, we assess a property? We will I mean, get into that. But before you get into that, let me just sort of run through a couple of things. Because when I was a sales agent, and I'm sure you found this yourself, Megan, then I would, you know, I used to say it was like when you go to an appraisal, right, it was like you're driving down the street and you're, you're trying to work out which house am I going, going to. You're looking at the numbers and, and it's like the big the wheel of fortune and you you know you spin the big wheel of fortune you're driving down the street you know tick 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 it's got it's got you know the jackpot and then oh by the way, I wasn't don't that one. remember this when I was selling property oh you don't remember this so you used to feel like the wheel of fortune and you're driving past all the houses it's like you know there's a ten dollar prize there's a hundred dollar prize there's the there's a bankrupt oh bugger there's the jackpot there's and if you pull up outside the house that you know is a cracker you know this thing's gonna fly out the door I want this listing because I know it will be popular versus you pull up outside the house. It's like, oh, I don't really want to miss this one. I know ultimately I'll <laughs> I'm going to struggle with this. It's and not going to be easy. Eight weeks, it's, so yeah, to, it's yeah. not going to be easy. That that fundamentally, that knowledge of those characteristics that lend a property to be that popular, it's like the jackpot on the wheel of fortune, <laughs> is fundamentally what you've got to learn in any area that you're looking at buying in because that, those characteristics that those buyers would love, other buyers love, that's your secret to capital growth. And that, that's uh, that's actually almost tipping our home buyer property principle or home buying principle on its head, isn't it? Which is if it's easy to buy, it's probably going to be hard to sell. And what mm. you're talking about is if it's hard to buy because there are so many people competing for it, so many people, so many you know bidders at the auction or yep. if it's private treaty, there are so many, um, you know, I, 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 fi- I just shake my head and, and want to want to you know, scream at people who say, I just don't want to get involved in an auction or mm. any multiple <laughs> offers. I just don't want to buy a property that way. Well, you know what you're going to buy? You're going to buy a B or a C grade property because they're the ones that no one else wants to buy. Yep. They're the ones Where that are there's easy active to buy. buyers, you need to know, you need to set your limit. Don't pay too much, but mm. you don't want a property that no one else wants. No, it's exactly right. It's, it's that, yeah, easy to buy, hard to sell hard to buy, easy to sell. And easy to sell is the secret. That's the holy grail. That's you know, the potential for capital growth. Abs- in a nutshell. Yep. And so, so the things that we avoid, like basic, before you get to yeah. the seven key areas, we don't like main roads. We don't like being opposite train lines or underneath. Or backing or the, onto it. Backing onto commercial. You know, there's, there's those um, houses that back onto, you know, the backs of shops and restaurants and stuff. You, you don't want flood zones. You don't want... Um, now it's not only zones Veronica and and this is this is something that I want to dispel with people some people talk about flood zones and Uh, suburbs that flood and 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 you know obviously I'm talking from a Brisbane perspective Mm. within a street the topography can be so hilly that two houses 
could flood terribly mm. and the rest of the street not and vice versa. So it's really important to get down to a very granular, granular level and look at the right flood maps, which is City Plan 2014, Brisbane City Council, not, not any of the others, um, to understand an, an individual property and it could get cut off. That's an important factor. It might not flood, but it might get mm. cut off. So um, flood zones or flood suburbs, we need to get that out of the conversation and start talking about whether a, whether a property floods or whether it has the other thing, which is overland flow. So looking at the mountains behind me, see how if water lands at the, you know, lands at the top of the mountain, it's got to make its way down somewhere down all of the hills that we've got in Brisbane, water has to make its way down and they're called overland flow paths and they can really interrupt what you can do with the property, have an effect on it and and cause, you know, pretty major water damage to pools and underhouses and so forth if you're not aware of them. So it's it's very, it's very micro level when you're looking at those sorts of things. We please do continue. and this is <laughs> please continue. Um, you know, We've got your first home buyer guide, which is the online course that we have, 10 steps for first home buyers. And we have a whole module, which is all about evaluation. And honestly, there is so much that you need to understand when you're buying a house. So whether you're buying it to invest as an investment or you're going to live in it yourself, if you're going to buy a property, you need to invest in your own knowledge so that you can actually make really good calls on this. Because this is the stuff that agents are going to volunteer this stuff. Well, their, their job is to sell a property. Mm. So so it's not their job to reveal anything about the property that you don't ask, but, um, you know, it's your job to do your due diligence and know what to ask and to know what you don't know so that you can actually find the answers to the things that you don't know. True, but there are, so, there are certain things that are really obvious. And so if you're at the bottom of a hill, um, particularly the dip of a hill, that's sort of a bit of a no-brainer that if there's going to be a lot of rain, your house just got to go somewhere. is going to be affected. So, yeah. and, and more educated buyers will shun properties like that without even bothering to evaluate them. And so it's like, you know, main roads in a hot market, people will buy stuff on main roads because they'll feel like they're priced out of the market. It's the only way they can buy into, a, into an area. Yeah. And in a slow market, that stuff does not walk out the door. That stuff is difficult to sell. And this is actually back to this easy to buy, hard to sell, like, Everything we talk about, it's the detail that you have to understand. The devil's in the detail. There's exceptions to every rule. In a hot market, <laughs> everything's hard to buy. So don't compete for everything. Think about what's going to be hard to, what's going to be easy to buy in a slow market. And that's a real fundamental to this capital growth. Now, talking about fundamentals, there are um, seven key areas and when when we assess a property 36 investment fundamentals that are unique a lot. to brisbane <laughs> so they're always unique to the place that you're, you're you're looking in but to give you an idea and this is kind of pretty generic these seven key areas it's it's around location so what's around it what are the schools what are the, where are the shops where are the shopping centers um how far is it to walk you know where the daycare centers all those sorts of things those, those sort of locational aspects and, and then transport what time Type of transport can you get? How easy is it? How long does it take? Um, in Brisbane, if you've got to change bus or train, that's a bit of a negative. Whereas in Sydney, changing to, to an, on another line, not that big a deal. Mm. Um, demographics. So who, who are the people that live in the suburb that you're looking at and how many of them rent and what's their um, household income? Mm. Uh, what's the rental pool like and, and, and are they singles you know if you're buying a one-bedroom apartment that's not going to sit very well if most of the demographic are for four people households um so you've got to make sure you're matching the property to the demographic of the area that you're buying in and then there's rentability and and that's the actual improvement so how many bedrooms bathrooms the what condition is it in what sort of improvements do you need to do what are the expectations of tenants in that kind of area um the potential you know what can you do with it what's the potential of the area uh supply this is a really big one so from a rentability point of view if you jump online and see there are 452 two-bedroom apartments available for rent in the suburb that you're looking at buying a two bedroom investment property in 
you are going to struggle to rent that property unless you keep dropping the rent or adding, uh, you know, offering incentives or giving rent-free periods or um, taking any tenant that would possibly put their hand up for the property. So supply is a really big one. Mm. Um, and, then it, and then affordability. If you are to buy a property that is you know, double the amount that most people would pay for a two-bedroom house in that particular suburb, you might really struggle to get a tenant because it's unaffordable to the kind of people that are want to, going to want to rent in that suburb. So they're kind of those seven key areas um, and then we break them down according to the location uh, and, and the investment fundamentals for that particular location. And that's that's real on the ground, local knowledge, understanding what tenants want and what future buyers want. And I think there's a lot of, um, you know, investment uh, coaches out there. There's a lot of <laughs> advice for first home buyers who want to rent fest. And in fact, a lot of them sort of have a real system around this and, and look, it is systematic. There is a process and, and this is what we're, we're teaching in the course. But the problem is there's no neat package rules such as, well, 70%, 30% owner-occupied tenants and and you know, as I said before, the, the, there's fundamentals and then there's exceptions to every rule and understanding those exceptions and when they apply is really, really critical to getting it right and not making a big mistake. Now, one of the other areas in which people make a big mistake is when they buy an investment property for tax reasons. And so we've mentioned this before in one of the earlier episodes so much, yeah. around, you know, account. we encourage you to get a good accountant to advise you on the structure and borrowing structure and, and, and tax planning, okay? Because if you're going to be buying an investment property, this is important. You don't want to shoot yourself in the foot by getting the structure wrong and paying more tax than you need to. Or buying and, in the wrong name. Oh, uh, lots of, oh, we yeah, buying in a trust in a, and you in can't, a, you know, yeah, buying however Buying a personal name when really it should be in a trust or creating a trust when it doesn't give you any advantages whatsoever. Exactly. So you want a good accountant who understands property and isn't just going to sort of look at the ways to reduce your tax because it's a bit like buying for yield, not for capital growth and sort of thinking that the extra rent every every week is going to make you rich or just the fact that it's not costing you anything is it's and I own a property. It's like it, it's only worthwhile owning a property if you can buy something that we can anticipate is going to go up in value over time. Not costing you anything is not the reason to buy a property. <laughs> and getting tax, you, you, could, you could not buy a property and not cost you any money. Yeah, and you can actually <laughs> invest that money in something that does go up and not even borrow any money and actually better off. So, <laughs> so we we want to make sure that you're not thinking that you're buying for tax reasons. And the, any tax deductions you get is icing on the cake. You definitely do not buy property for its deductibility. And that's just something, and, and once again, and we bang on Good about basic. it, about mm. buying brand new and all that sort of stuff. There's so many hooks to lure you into buying brand new because you get all this depreciation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you maximise your deductions. Yes, that's true. You will maximise your deductions, but the sacrifice will be capital growth. And if you don't focus on capital growth, there's absolutely no point in investing in property. You can invest in other things that don't cost you anything. <laughs> and aren't as great a risk. You know, at the end of the day, there is risk involved, yep. mm. you know, and, and, and you need to keep that into consideration. The other the other thing to think about is as a rent vester, you're going to need a property manager. We would strongly advise not trying to self-manage a property because if you have a full-time job or you have a little business or, you know, something that you're starting and working on that needs your time and attention, it is virtually impossible to keep up with the changes in legislation that will protect you as an owner of a property from potential litigation from a tenant if you miss something or you get something wrong. So by appointing a property manager, you are really managing and mitigating your risk as an owner of a property. They're also trained to make sure that they select the right tenant, get the pricing of the property right, go through the application process, and then make sure the asset is being managed and looked after and maintained properly. So sometimes as an owner, you might go to a property and think, oh yeah, I probably should do something about those gutters, but I'm gonna leave it for another year. Um, a property manager is gonna look at it with a clear set of eyes and go, if you don't do something about this now and get those leaves out of there, you're gonna 
have to replace the gutters in a year. So if you want another five years out of it, let's do a gutter clean for $220. So they can actually look at things and help you manage your costs so that you're not looking at big unexpected repair bills by giving you an ongoing assessment of the property and its condition and also how the tenants are maintaining it. So property management is definitely a cost to take into account, but it is an investment in your investment property. It is not to be seen as something that you're giving away um, without some sort of return. Choosing a good property manager, however, is is a bit of a minefield and um, we actually haven't got anything in the course about choosing a property manager, but we might do a blog and a, and a podcast in the future on that, Veronica. I think that's a damn fine idea and I, and I also think that we will, uh, in a future version of the course, we'll have a separate investor course. Yeah, we will. Yeah. might just have a side, even a side tutorial on it. There's so much to learn. Um, now, costs are interesting because costs typically sit around around about 20 to 25% of the rental yield. So, you know, the income that you get, you have to spend, you know, there are costs of owning a property. So the cost would be the property management fees for starters and insurance and maintenance and rates and all that sort of thing. Um, Smoke alarms. Yes. And getting those. And and that's another good example about legislation. and, and Yes. And yes, 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 yes. yes. So much to cost. And this is another reason why capital growth is so important because these properties cost money and the rental income comes in and that's great. But typically until you're at sort of a later stage in your life and your debt's really, really low, you can't really have the income from or live off the income from your property. So the idea being it's got to work hard for you and grow in value. So then you've got loads of options down the track. That's that's the holy grail of property uh, investment or property ownership. And the other type of management that you might need to consider if you're buying an apartment is um, a strata manager. And it's one of the, it's one of the, the, factors of due diligence that you need to take into account is how that building is being managed and it's certainly something that we do take you through it's very complex and something we do take you through in the course but the a good strata manager and a good property manager is fantastic you know from an investor's point of view yeah. particularly if you're what we call a set and forget investor where you 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 just want the job the property to do its job and and you want the in the uh, experts to tell you when things need to be done and make Absolutely. proactive recommendations. So a good strata manager. You don't manager. get to choose your strata manager. No, Let's just make that really clear. You don't get to buy an apartment and then decide who your strata manager is going to be. It's it's actually the owner's corporation or the body corporate um, who choose the strata manager or the body corporate manager. And that is the collective owners who own the properties within that co- complex. But you do get to choose whether you buy a property based on if they've got a crappy strata manager or not. <laughs> and and I have recommended to clients properties that we've really liked, but once we've got into the nitty gritty of it and realised that this is really poorly managed and these owners corporation aren't that interested in changing it, then you think, you know what, you're buying into a whole heap of problems. Whereas yeah. other really well run, you can see a well run building when you get a really good strata report with no gaps, all mm. the information you need, really good record keeping, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's the signs of a good strata manager and it's it's one of the costs, obviously, of um, owning any property, whether you live in it or whether it's an investment. But from the investment fundamental side of thing, it's one of those costs, but also an investment fundamental thing about having a really good building manager or the building being managed by a good management, that absolutely is part of the investment decision at the outset. Yeah, and, and particularly if there's more owner occupiers in the building than there are investors, you know, we don't we don't necessarily say don't buy an apartment. Not, that is not um, the basis of some of our recommendations. It's it's the type of apartment, the building that you're buying in, having a Where good number is. of owner occupiers in there. Um, it's established. It has a good history. Um, you can look at body corporate records. These are all good things to look at when you're looking at a, a, a something that is in a strata plan. All right. Well, Veronica, in this episode, we've covered a very small part of our 10-step online course for first home buyers but if you'd like to learn more about the process and how to buy without making a mistake then head over to our website don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss an episode and if you like what you've heard today please give us an itunes review five stars please (laughs) it will help other people find us too Thank you for joining us. We hope you found this really useful. And if you have, please share the love with others who you know are in the same boat. We'll be back next week with some more priceless stuff. See you then.